it was the florist. They grew in the greenhouse and this was their offices and retail. Uh, so you can see uh, that the property was significantly blighted just a couple of years ago. This is an image of the barn uh, that we're standing in right now and an image of some structures that were on the site. When 2008, kind of when the housing market crashed, um, a lot of people lost a lot of value and then folks walked away from their houses. So we foreclose on anywhere from 100 to 200 parcels a year and there's about 30 to 40 that need to come down every single year. So the blight is in Climax this year, it's in Kay Township, it's in Comstock, it's in Cooper, it's in the city, it's in the township, it's everywhere. These uh, have been factory sites for more than 100 years. When people, you told them you worked at old Flint manufacturing, and they knew it was a lot of folk. But eventually, it just trickled down to nothing. And that's what's so disheartening at the present time. The cut when it was unused as a former rail corridor really became sort of a, an overgrown place for vagrants. And we kept hearing the same thing over and over again. We weren't sure what to do with this site, um, but we felt like it was important because it was on the Kalamazoo River and it was on the uh, Kalamazoo River Valley Trail. Set me free and I will be afraid enough to find it. Take my hand or take a stand and I would never mind it. Just take me away. It was called Happy Valley once upon a time. Behind me is what was once called Chevrolet Flint Manufacturing. When I hired in in 1957, there were approximately, I think, somewhere around six or 7,000 people working at this complex down here at that time. We're driving through, this would have been the shop floor, like on this side they're making pistons, on the left side they're making the clutches. And it was the place where the lumber industry, the carriage industry, the auto industry all started and flourished. It also includes the properties uh, that were the site of the great sit-down strike in 1936 and 37. It's in every U.S. history book in the country and this is where that took place. The original site was about I think 140 acres and that includes what is now part of Kettering University but the 60 acres that the city owns is the section of the site that we're, we're dealing with right now. The site's obviously highly contaminated. It has a lot of history and issues. Oil in the ground in some places, several feet thick, 10 feet thick. So similar to many cleanups around the country, you know, we're focusing on managing the contamination in place because trying to clean up a site fully is just, it's always too expensive, it's too difficult, and often a site like this located on the sensitive Flint River, you can make the conditions worse just by trying to remove the material. Once upon a time, while General Motors, these factories that were on the site contributed towards the economic vitality of the county, uh, it did create issues for the neighborhoods. Once thriving neighborhoods became the areas you didn't want to live because of pollution, uh, environmental quality around it, sound, traffic. What uh, residents and neighbors and local businesses wanted to see in that area and the vision of Chevy Commons is what we heard. There is an opportunity to cap and green it so it's like a park-like space that's right on the riverfront and sits between downtown University of Michigan Flint and, and Kettering University so you have a, a green corridor um, right in downtown Flint. There'll be a 10 foot wide walking or bicycle path that just makes a loop through the whole property and comes back out and all of this will be grass with areas of bushes and trees and, and at this end will be a lowland, like a wetland area. Even though I no longer live here in Michigan, it's sad to me to see the area the way it is now. 
It's emotional for me to even think about it and look at it. My family actually moved to Flint in 1856, and so we've been Flint residents since, and I personally have a huge interest in seeing this redeveloped. This is my home. Uh, there are many people here who are committed to our community and who want to see uh, Flint brought back, and I think shoving the hole is one of the most important projects that will support not only the downtown area, but the neighborhood surrounding downtown. And now, as we transition to a more diverse uh, 21st century economy that's anchored in higher education and healthcare and neighborhoods that are judged by their quality of life instead of how close they are to the factory, we're redesigning uh, this area along the river to a place that really produces uh, natural beauty and health and wellness and enjoyment. And that's the vision for Chevy Commons. The first year we foreclosed on the vacant five acres. The next year we foreclosed on the blighted parcel that was the greenhouse. And this year we foreclosed on the garage, which is near the front of the road. Then we had a lot of community input. Should we raise the whole thing and build something new? Or could it be saved? We are at 1523 Riverview, the site of a formerly abandoned and vacant property. So you can see from the state of the structures, this was sort of the state of the entire site about a year ago. One of the early things we did over the last year was restore this barn. And we've been using this as an event space. A local artist created some of these fish sculptures, which are all fish that are native to the river. We've been incorporating the arts into a lot of our conversations as it relates to vacant spaces. Um, we're working with a local artist, Conrad Kaufman, who designed these beams and posts for us. You can see we had some volunteers place some benches out here. We were able to salvage wood from some of the trees that were on the site. The refreshing part is, is not a lot of people knew about this site. So I've had a lot of fun telling people about this site, and when they get there, they're just awestruck with, my gosh, We've been driving by it and we just never really paid attention. The water is always a huge asset, right? And then the trailway is unbelievably popular and is used a whole lot. A lot of folks said, gosh, wouldn't it be great if we could open up those sight lines to the river? You can see what a difference that's made if you look down here. You wouldn't even know you're riding or running by the river. And then the area that's been cleared by volunteers really opens up those sight lines. There are a lot of environmental features at the site. Uh, we've worked um, closely with the Nature Center. We've been involved with a few different areas here. Uh, one of them is a restoration project, about five and a half acres of restoration and about a half an acre of that is along the Kalamazoo River. We also are doing a sort of a different, whole different scale project, which is a natural playground. Outdoor experiences in children's lives are really starting to decline. And as a result of that, we're seeing increase in child obesity, we're seeing increases of, of attention deficit disorder. We basically did some evaluations and we decided, wouldn't it be cool if we could create um, safe spaces for kids. So uh, Riverview Launch is hoping to do that here on this site. They've actually started a small one already, which is exciting with some logs and some rocks. So we had approached uh, Tribal Revival Gardens and asked if they would like to do something on the site early on and they were interested in bees. This is a native bee condo and it's a structure for native bees, mostly mason bees in our area. They nest in these little tubes and we've got a variety of tubes from different plant material that have hollow stems. We can, you can see a lot of them, if you get up close, are, are sealed with some kind of a mud-like substance, you know? And that means somebody's home. So probably every two years, we'll turn this. This is a cube that spins on a spindle. They'll emerge out of the holes in the back, and then when they come out, they'll find the new nesting materials. So all this stuff, after they go through their two-year cycle, will be thrown away to prevent disease. And... The reason why there is so much creativity here is because we, you know, we presented the, the parcel to the community and we really invited a lot of folks to participate and come up with the ideas. We've had probably 150 to 200 volunteers doing everything from rolling sod to planting flowers to painting murals, painting the barn. This is going to be such a fabulous 
connector to downtown to the Nature Center, Spring Valley Park. I mean, it's just this is a, just going to be a gem in our community's uh, landscape. A lot of volunteer work out out here and other places for the land bank. And we, as a community, have come together to try and redevelop this orphan site into something really beautiful. It's going to be something that we all can be proud of. So the Dequinicut sits right on Atwater Street, right off of the Detroit River. Uh, it runs from Atwater Street all the way up to Gratiot Avenue, and we're currently working on an extension that'll take it all the way to Mack Avenue. It's a former rail line from the Grand Trunk Western Rail Line, uh, and the trains used to come right down here. It sits right at the entrance to the Detroit River with the dry dock, so freighters used to come in, unload their cargo, and put it right onto trains, and then send the trains up and distribute that, uh, those goods and those, those materials all over the country and all over the state. The cut when it was unused as a former rail corridor really became sort of a, an overgrown place for vagrants. And you know, there were a couple of people who were sort of living there and doing bad things. Uh, so we've taken that, decommissioned the rail line and turned it into a wonderful walking path and a biking path. And it's really become a great spot in the city. It's sunken underground, uh, so you can have a good feel of sort of this peaceful experience within the context of a very vibrant and active city. So the Detroit Riverfront Conservancy is responsible for all the management and maintenance and programming associated with the Dequinder Cut. So one of the things we take very seriously, obviously being in Detroit in an urban area, any urban area, you're going to need to make sure that safety is at a, at a high level. We provide uh, call boxes, security cameras on the Dequinder Cut to make sure that people feel comfortable. If an issue does happen, we have security, which is on bikes or on vehicles, who can respond very quickly as well. People really love the Dequinder Cut, and, and it's, it's like the Riverwalk where people have a real sense of ownership of the space. Whether it's Lafayette Park residents, whether it's kids who are coming down to University Preparatory Academy for their high school experience, it, it really is a place where people feel like they belong, and they do, and people feel a sense of ownership, which is absolutely valid. Everyone owns the Dequinder Cut, everyone owns the Detroit Riverwalk, and it's great to have those two places connected in such a vital way. The Riverwalk has always been envisioned as a connector to a much larger Greenways link, and the Dequinder Cut is one of those critical spokes. So we'll really be on a circuit for bikers, pedestrians, people exercising, and people just sort of want to get away from the, the everyday hustle and bustle of the city. So we're very excited in 2015 that the construction will extend the Dequinder Cut from one and a half miles to two miles. It'll take it from Gratiot Avenue all the way up to Mack Avenue. And that pathway will actually gradually take you up two grades. So you'll hit the neighborhoods uh, at Mack and you'll also be able to connect directly to Eastern Market, which is one of my favorite parts of the city. So taking it from the riverfront all the way to Eastern Market. And to be able to connect that directly to the Riverfront Conservancy and the Riverwalk uh, is really a great thing. Vacant is, I guess it's an event. We, we hold different events in vacant spaces. People buy a ticket to the event and they don't know what they're buying a ticket for. Um, we, we will send them email clues after they buy a ticket. So they have no idea really what the event is. And they also don't know where the event is actually being held. Uh, and then we also give back at least half of the profits, but as much as we can um, to a neighborhood-based nonprofit in the neighborhood where we hold the event. Uh, it's a group of us who are all volunteers, no one gets paid. All of us pitched in money to create a seed pot to get started with it, and then we just hold these special events in the community, um, trying to show people what, what a space could be. And it all came about, Subin Nurkuli, this was her idea. I am the founder, <laughs> so I'm the one who came up with the crazy idea in the first place. And I thought, well, what happens while people are trying to fill a space? It just They just sit there. I thought it'd be amazing to kind of showcase what could be in a space 
Vacant four was bourbon and bingo. <laughs> and um, it, it kind of evolved from a number of people throwing ideas out there. We had a little act, kind of a little show in between where we had a couple of different musicians play. We had a comedian. Um, we, we dressed up the building in kind of a Florida type theme and some of the clues that were, were sent out sort of alluded to kind of a, a 1960s Miami style theme and, and it was just, it was a lot of fun. Kate's Vintage Cafe provided the food. Ryan Wirt, who's a big part of the Rio Town Commercial Association, he started working with us on the committee this time and he was just absolutely phenomenal. So we were able to tie in a lot of Rio Town people. Okay, so the original tag, tagline for Vacant Lansing was vacant spaces, vacant minds. Just as a concept, that's how it began. You have a vacant space. There are so many ways to envision what could go in there. So why not have people's minds racing a little bit longer? Have them dream new ways that they envision the space being used um, and then have them experience something they may or may not have expected. We give them clues. When you buy a ticket, you get clues, you know, up through till the day, but we like to keep them suspenseful just to add some intrigue, you know. Most people know what they're doing on a Friday night. It's kind of fine, fun not to know what you're doing. One way to prevent blight is by helping to stop foreclosures. The Michigan Foreclosure Prevention Corps has 20 AmeriCorps members serving across the state of Michigan to help people at risk of losing their homes to foreclosure. I am part of the Michigan Foreclosure Prevention Corps. This is my second year, so I've expanded upon my service, but the first year was intake and triage, which is a fancy way for saying you're the first point of contact for a lot of vulnerable homeowners. So homeowners usually, when they are facing foreclosure, are very distraught. They don't know what resources are out there. I just advise people and let them know how the foreclosure process works. It's kind of confusing. There's a lot of weird legal rules about it. Um, so that's been great. And I've also been able to point people in the direction to get funding that they wouldn't have known was out there. At Center for Financial Health, I work with clients regarding home buyer education and also foreclosure prevention. So we help clients on both ends of the spectrum. Most recently, we had two clients who were behind in their mortgages three to four months. So in those situations, they're close to eviction. Um, and we were able to pull their files together, uh, get them submitted to step forward. However, uh, through the counseling and consultation, before step forward even came in, we were able to get them uh, modified through their mortgage so that they could keep their homes. If we didn't have the foreclosure prevention program, we would have a lot of people that would have lost their property. And uh, the best part is being able to keep people in their home. To me, homes are it's the most important thing. It's kind of the starting point for someone to have a well-balanced life. Personally and professionally, it's knowing your way around home ownership is invaluable. And that's great that I can help people understand it. It's also great that in my own life, I will, you know, no one's going to get a predatory loan on me. Every time I go to AmeriCorps training and around other uh, agencies and different individuals I met, I get a well that is full of resources, knowledge, a way to do things and kind of brainstorm and be able to talk about it. The professional development has been just wonderful the courses, certifications, and information that we get um, is just something that's been phenomenal. You know, I, I really hadn't expected that, to be honest. I'm also doing a lot of different conferences that I probably would have never went to, passing a leadership baton, women empowerment. Um, I go to Kentucky for a big conference with NeighborWorks, so it's really exciting. I can't explain the shift that has come with AmeriCorps. I think when you work in direct service, you learn so much about yourself you learn how to prioritize, and you learn how to prioritize while being empathetic. The Michigan Vacant Property Campaign works with leaders in the state who are committed to turning the vacant properties in their communities into assets. The MVPC is a working collaboration of four organizations with unique expertise related to vacant property issues. Created to develop a statewide network of practice and expertise, the MVPC assists small, rural, suburban, and metropolitan areas. The MVPC's core activities are to provide education and outreach, community and partner technical assistance, 
local campaign formation, and policy and systems development. The campaign website also provides access to data and resources, such as the Michigan Community Foreclosure Response Toolkit and Detroit Vacant Properties Toolbox. For more on all of these tools, visit michiganvacantproperty.org. When we pick a very, very targeted approach, you can really, really see the benefit. So we're very excited about the potential because we believe that this is the key to actually actualizing all the space around the, around the river so neighborhoods can be brought back. Because we feel it will play a really important role in revitalizing this area. That's uh, why the Genesee County Land Bank is involved as a partner. Everyone wanted it to be a recreational space, uh, not something that was fenced off for a few workers only, but was something that was open to the entire community. And that's what's great about the space. Is it's, it's such a flexible, wonderful place that you know, it really works in a lot of different ways for a lot of different people. Working with abandoned and vacant parcels can be challenging, and figuring out how to repurpose them is, is a difficult and challenging task. I think one of the things we know is we don't have all the answers, but we've also discovered with some of these places that they really provide unique opportunities to bring the community together. This isn't the last project that's going to make it a great town, but this is the kind of project everyone needs to adopt and to be part of uh, to continue to make this a great town. We hatched this design ourselves. It's never been tried before. We sent it off to the Xerxes Society and they gave us a thumbs up on it and said they thought it was a great idea so we're going to keep an eye on it and see how, how it works. When I was assigned to Plant 2, I was in the crank department. Weighing 155 pounds and the cranks weighed 85 pounds in the rough. It's going to help stabilize the underground conditions, prevents groundwater movement, Kind of like we are preventing from moving here. I don't know if I can get through up here. You've got a rainbow over your face. Okay. <laughs> right. You have a rainbow right here. <laughs> that, that would be me. Yeah. I'm so happy. <laughs> <laughs>